Okay, well, we're going to talk a little bit about Jesus now and about his death on the cross and what that really means. And I guess um, we're going towards Easter, so we're in a little series, and it's called Cross Vision. And I, I guess, you know, I've got a cross I wear around my neck. My wife, Tina, gave it to me when I was 21, for my 21st birthday. And it's been there ever since, pretty much. And um, it's weird, isn't it, that we take a symbol of torture and death and shame, which the cross was, a place where... Uh, runaway slaves or rebellious slaves or bandits would be put to death on a cross. So we've made that a bit of jewellery and people have all, all kinds of wear it. Why has why the cross um, been turned around in the way that it does? And I think one reason why it's been turned around because Jesus is always turning things around. He turns things upside down and he, he, he transforms our lives and he transforms the cross. And at the cross, the victory of God was won. But I think that there are so many facets to the cross. It's such a, a, a huge kind of pivotal hinge for the whole of history. And there are so many dimensions of the cross that we may need to spend a bit of time thinking about several of them. And so tonight I want to think a bit about ransom and what it means for Jesus' death on the cross to be a ransom. And I, I think a question that you might have, have had at some point, or you might have tonight, is, God, why was the cross really necessary? If we need to be forgiven, why couldn't you just forgive us? I mean, we do that. We forgive people. When people say sorry, we forgive them. We don't, we don't kind of demand some kind of penitential act or some kind of sacrifice. Or What is it, God? Why, why, does, why did the cross have to happen? Why couldn't you just show mercy and let us all off? Did anyone ever wrestle with that question? Put your hand up if you did. All right. I think it's a real question for people who aren't in this room tonight. If we're going to talk about Jesus and talk about his death on the cross, they might have that question. And I want to, to point the way at least to some kind of answers about that. And I think that if we're going to understand Jesus, who he was, and what he came to do, we, we really need to get our, our heads around the whole of the Bible. Because the Old Testament of the Bible prepares the way for Jesus to come into the world. And there are many, many things that the Old Testament um, teaches, and there are many practices of the people of God in the Old Testament that are really anticipating, preparing the way for, pointing towards that which is going to come. And the, the challenge, actually, for the Jewish people was that, that they didn't always learn the lessons that God was trying to teach them at that time. And, and sometimes they got locked into things and couldn't see the real thing when it fi finally arrived. But it, that was what it was designed to do, to prepare them. And there are a number of themes in, in the Bible which I just want to just tell you about in a moment. But first of all, I'll, I'll, well, yeah, I'll tell you about them now. There's the, there's, the, there's the whole theme of redemption. In the Old Testament, God gives people things to have in perpetuity, and particularly around the land, when the people of Israel came out of slavery into a new land that God prepared for them, they had inheritances, they had land that was given to them and their descendants. And if people messed up and got lazy or got into debt or had to to sell their land, someone from the family was allowed and encouraged and had the right to buy it back. And there's a great story um, uh, called um, uh, the, in the book of Ruth where th this, this whole story is demonstrated where some of the family is able to buy um, an inheritance. And a link with that inheritance is actually a relationship. Um, but I won't go into that. But just to say it's a practice. This, this God gave his people a, a, a code which allowed them to buy back things that had been lost. And actually, the, the idea of, the, you've heard of Jubilee perhaps, but the idea was that there's kind of like a reset in the people of Israel, that everybody gets their possessions, but everybody gets to start again. But we won't go into that now, it's a whole different, different series. <coughs> but there's also a, a, a whole idea about um, ransom that happens in the Old Testament. And redemption and ransom are very similar ideas. When we redeem something, we buy it back. But when we ransom something, we pay to release someone from captivity. 
So it's a little bit different, isn't it? If I kind of take this cross that Tina bought me, and I've got a bit hard up, you know, life as a minister is tricky, and, you know, and um, I, li- I like to uh, eat a lot of donuts, and anyway, I need to buy some donuts. I could take this cross and take it to a pawn shop and give it to them, and they would give me some money, and I'd go down to Krispy Kreme Donuts and buy some donuts. And if I wanted to get the cross back, and Tina, by the way, would be really annoyed if I'd done that, I'd need to redeem it, and I'd need to pay some money to get it back, and probably I'd need to pay back a bit more money than I got in the first place. But what happens, actually, if Tina, my lovely wife, gets kidnapped by a gang and they're holding her in captivity. If I want to get her back and I have to pay some money, it's not going to be the same as redeeming her. It's going to be a ransom. Does that make sense? And, and, and back in, 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 in our history, and in, in actually in, uh, in times of war, people would be ransomed. It's often got a, com- king, a conflict. You know, think of King Richard the Lionheart. Do you, do you remember him? One of our great kind of crusading kings, you know, we kind of, when, when I was a kid, Richard the Lionheart thought, oh, he's a really swashbuckling kind of military leader, but he got kidnapped. Well, he, he, got, he, he got defeated in battle and um, was actually held as a prisoner for some, for some time and had, the, the English had to pay a ransom to get him out. And, and those sort of things happen in battle. In battle, people could be captured and a ransom needs to be paid. But it, it can also be a bandit or a, or a, or a criminal can capture people. I just want to think what it's like actually today when, when people are, are captive. It might be like in, in trafficking situations. I don't know if you can imagine, actually. I, I, I just made up a little story to try and illustrate what I was thinking. But thinking of, of say, somebody who has a, a daughter or maybe a fiancé or, or someone that they really love, but somebody who they're really connected to, that they really love, but that person begins to go off the rails and maybe they start doing drugs and maybe they get a bit involved in some people who are dealing and, and using drugs. And maybe somebody is, is very charming and offers them some stuff and says, look, if you want, if you want some coke, have it on me. And, and actually come, and, come back to my place and come and meet my friends. And, and, and maybe kind of almost seduces this person into a lifestyle that is a trap. You can imagine, maybe they even marry that person but it turns out that the, the person they've married is someone who's abusive and just wants to pimp them, to, prosti- to prostitute them, wants to, wants to um, just abuse them and, and, and make them a, a captive, a bit of a slave. And just imagine if you really loved that person, perhaps that was your daughter and, or someone that you would loved, how would you get them back? And maybe you would love them enough to want to sell what you had to give in order to kind of release them from that kind of hold that was over them. But it's not straightforward because they've, made, they've colluded with that person. They've made a commitment to that person. How are you going to set them free? There's a story in the Bible like that. It's from the book of Hosea. And Hosea is a prophet and God asks him to do something quite extraordinary, which is to marry somebody who God tells he's going to be unfaithful. And Hosea was acting out in his own marriage, in his own life, a relationship between God and Israel, where God um, has called Israel to be like his bride, to be like his beloved. But she kind of sells herself to other gods. And that's a picture of what happened to Israel, that instead of uh, honoring their relationship with the God who delivered them from captivity out of Egypt, brought them to the promised land, they they started to run after the gods of of the nations around them and pursue them and and their their kind of vile ways, actually. um, So in the story of of Hosea, God says to Hosea, you know, your, your wife has left you, she's become a prostitute, I want you to go and buy her back. And this is what it says, the Lord said to me, Hosea 3, Go show your love to your wife again, though she's loved by another and is an adulteress. Love her as the Lord loves the Israelites, though they turn to other gods and love the sacred raisin cakes. So I bought her for 15 shekels of silver and about a home in a lethek of barley. And I told her, you're to live with me for many days. You must not be a prostitute or be intimate with any man and I'll live with you. And it's, 
It's an extraordinary picture. Extraordinary. You know, part of what the cross is, is Jesus paying a ransom, redeeming a bride. Let me just read you a verse from the book of Acts. Just came across this as I was just reading back, so I wasn't looking for it, but I think it's extraordinary. Paul's writing, speaking actually to elders of the church in Ephesus, and he says to them, these church leaders, keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. What an extraordinary verse. The church of God, bought by God, bought by Jesus with his own blood, paid for, rescued because he loves his church. And ransom, redemption, who do we pay a ransom to? I think it's important to distinguish in the theology of the cross a difference between a ransom and sacrifice. A sacrifice is made to God. But a ransom is made to someone who holds other people captive. That's the definition of what a ransom is. It's something that's paid to release something from captivity. So when Jesus positions himself and tells us what his life and death is all about, he actually takes both those ideas and more. But in, in Mark's gospel, in, in um, Jesus' perhaps a really clear statement in Mark chapter 10, verse 45, he said, the Son of Man didn't come to serve, to, sorry, to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. This is how Jesus positions the cross. The Son of Man didn't come to be served, even the Son of Man, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Who's the ransom going to be paid to is perhaps a question that we should be thinking. Jesus also positions himself as a sacrificial lamb. And next week, we're going to be thinking about the cross of sacrifice. And when Jesus um, chose the Passover meal as a time to reveal himself and, and his journey to the cross, that was a whole different facet of what the cross means, a different angle on the diamond. But tonight, I want us to think about ransom. So, <coughs> we wouldn't have guessed that the way that the victory of God would be revealed would be in him giving himself up in being a ransom. The disciples couldn't get their head around it. They, they expected um, the, the victory of God to be a power transaction where the armies of, the, of, the, of evil are overwhelmed by the superior might and power of God. They weren't prepared for the vulnerability of someone who would self-give in the way that the Bible describes. And so it was hard for them to get their heads around what was going on. That's why it's really important that the Old Testament backdrop was there for them to get their heads a little bit about ransom and redemption. And I, th I think the reality is that the world, as Jesus saw it, our state as people, as, as God sees it and understands it, is a state where we are in captivity. And you might have heard me say um, how much I've been impacted by a verse again from the testimony of St. Paul before Festus and King Agrippa in Acts 26, when he describes the call of God in his life. And he says these things. He says, God sent me to the Gentiles to take them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, for the forgiveness of sins and a place amongst those who are sanctified. And this is the worldview through the eyes of Jesus, who knows what's going on, who sees things as they are. And he says, men and women are under the power of Satan. And they need to come under the power of God. They're in one kingdom. They need to come into another. They need to find a place where they're forgiven for sin, which at the moment binds them to the architect of evil. And they need to find a place amongst the redeemed holy people of God, his church, his beloved, his bride. 
And it's a ransom and a redemption that make those things possible. So, so why? I want to, want to suggest to you um, that we ourselves sell ourselves, that we give ourselves over to powers that then control us. And, and we may do it unwittingly. We, we, may do, we, we, we probably all, from time to time, say yes to evil thoughts. Jesus once said to some people, why do you entertain evil thoughts in your heart? But you may well have done that yourself. And it may have been you've entertained bitterness, unforgiveness, lust, uh, anger, um, lies. You, you may have kind of um, felt empowered. You may have felt stronger by nursing grudges and grievances. And whenever you do that, actually you're colluding with the powers of evil. And the reality is that we reach a position where Satan has a hold on us. There's some almost, it's almost like we've signed a contract with, uh, with, with that. You know, back in the day, there were these kind of, like, uh, the, the, the stories of Faust and um, someone who kind of sells his soul to the devil, or, or it might be a blues player at the crossroads and you sell his soul to the devil. You make a contract. But those, those kind of, kind of, sort of stories and legends and everything are actually a bit of a picture of, of something that we, we can do, that we can make a contract with, with the devil who happens to be very legalistic, actually. But do you know that Jesus, there was no hold for the devil, for Satan, in him. That's one of the, just one of the, the key things. In, in John's Gospel, Jesus actually says to his followers, you know, there's a time coming, the prince of this world, he calls him, is coming. John 14, verse 30, I'll read it to you. I'll not speak with you much longer, for the prince of this world is coming. The, the worldview, again, that Jesus has is that there is a power in the world. It's enemy-occupied territory. And, and we have been in a situation of a degree of uh, slavery and collusion with that power. But Jesus says about himself, he's coming, but he has no hold on me. And Jesus uniquely is able to say that. There is nothing in Jesus, for Satan to hold on to. And that's why Jesus is uniquely able to be a ransom. Now, what, what does it mean for, for Satan to have a hold on us? Well, one thing that it means is that we can't just freely embrace the kingdom of God for a number of reasons. First of all, because God is holy and his kingdom doesn't mix with evil. And if we're contaminated by that stuff, we need to get clean because otherwise it will, we, we, just, it, it, we can't really engage with it. It's a bit like I've got cancer and I, I need to get well, but the, the treatment's too strong, it will kill me. You know, the, the radiation, the, the, the treatment that I'm getting, it, it's too powerful. It's going to kill cancer, but it's going to kill all of me. And, and the holiness of God is a little bit like that. It's like a consuming fire. And, and though we need that, that fire to cleanse us, actually, we can't handle it unless there's a means of grace. So that, that's part of the factor. But the other thing is, the enemy doesn't want to let us go. And the, the, name, the name Satan, actually, is a, is a law court word. It's if, if, if today we, we might use it, the prosecution. Satan means accuser. And in, in the Bible, in the Old Testament, again, we've got a little law court scene where we see this in action. And I'll just read it to you. This is from Zechariah chapter 3. He showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right side to accuse him. And, and, and it's that sense of... Mm, I've got an accuser, someone who says to God, who is the good and holy judge, God, you can't let that person off because you'd be breaking your own laws if you did that. Look what they've done. God, you can't have this person in the kingdom because look how they've aligned themselves with me and my kingdom. And, and it's as if, if, if the Satan is saying in the presence of God and to us, we can't be free. We're held. We're guilty. 
we're enslaved. That he's got a legal right to keep us trapped. And in this lovely passage uh, in Zechariah, it says, The Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord who's chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is not this man a burning stick snatched from the fire? And Joshua was dressed in filthy clothes as he stood before the angel. And the angel said to those who were standing before him, Take off his filthy clothes. And he said to Joshua, See, I've taken away your sin. I'll put a rich garment on you. And, and, and this, is, this is a kind of picture of, of, of the kind of the behind the scenes view of the heavenly law courts, if you like. And, 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 and but how Satan is. But we're all familiar with the accuser, I would suggest. The one who says to us, You're unclean, you can't be in the presence of God. And we need someone to make us clean. We need redemption. And, and, and more of that anon as we continue to look at the cross. But, but given that, that Satan's an accuser, and he has a hold on us. Jesus, who comes to give his life as a ransom, says, you know what? He's got no hold on me. And I'm going to give yourself in my place. Now, one of the big weapons of, of Satan, and by the way, if, if, you, if you find the, the language of, of Satan and evil and all that kind of stuff uncongenial, or you just think I'm, I'm a bit medieval in my mindset, I apologize for that, but I just want to, I want to ask you just to take it seriously and consider it. Because I, I believe these things are, are true spiritual realities, and, and, and they really help us to underpin our understanding of what's going on in the world that we live in. So I do believe in, in, a, in a world where there is a, a brokenness in creation itself, where, where we are in enemy-occupied territory, and I believe it, it, it took um, a, a, sal a salvation act of, of, of God through Jesus Christ that was as powerful as the D-Day landings in enemy occupied Europe to bring a bridgehead in the world to, to set us free from those things that have enslaved us. I think it's as more powerful than that, but that's, that's a picture of it. But one of the outworkings of being not in God's kingdom and in the kingdom of darkness, the kingdom that is held by Satan, is that there's a concept which we call death. Because a thing that, that God hates Sorry, a thing that the devil hates, rather, the thing that Satan hates is the image of God. He just hates God. And he hates the image of God in human beings. And is always trying to dehumanize people, to make them less human than they really are. Less loving, less creative, less beautiful, less, uh, I, I don't know, open. He wants to shrivel and diminish and wither them. And... Um, when we're outside of the presence of God, those things can happen to us pretty seriously. And the ultimate dehumanizing of an individual is death. And that's why, actually, death is sometimes called the last enemy. It's really interesting. I read to you some verses from Hosea, didn't I? And um, it's, there's some verses in Hosea which are quoted by St. Paul in the New Testament in, in 1 Corinthians 15, where... He says this, the end of, of Hosea. And Hosea is a, a wonderful book because it's, it's a book where God is kind of saying, these guys have really rejected me, they've really hurt me, but I can't give them up. I want to redeem them. Just like Hosea, you can't give up on your wife. I can't give up on my people. I've got to buy them back. And then towards the end of the book, he says this, I'll ransom them from the power of the grave. I will redeem them from death. Where, O oh death, are your plagues? Where, O oh grave, is your destruction? Uh, Hosea 13, verse 14. There's a sense that in this book, which at the beginning speaks about a human redemption, of a husband buying back uh, a wife who's gone really wayward and got herself into big trouble. Then we've got the picture of Israel, and then beyond Israel, humanity, if you like, and, and God saying, just like you, Hosea, redeemed your wife from the consequences of what she'd done, from her slavery, and brought her back into a relationship with you. I'm going to redeem my people from the consequences of what they've done, that they've brought them into this place of death. And for us, part of what ransom means is Jesus walked into the place of death. It's important that he died. Because the author of life walked into death. And I don't know whether you feel that, that Satan would trade his 
asset, which is human, humanity. <laughs> the human race who, who are kind of subject to sin and death. Why would he trade that kind of degree of leverage with God? Why would he deliver that degree of malice? And, and it's because there's a pearl of great price that he's willing to say, well, if I'll have that, then I'll let the rest of that stuff go. And the only sufficient ransom for the whole of humanity is God himself. The only sufficient ransom for us is the one in whom there is no shadow or darkness at all. The one who through life came into being. And Jesus offered himself in our place at the cross. When he chose to die, it was to be a ransom from the power of death. I love Psalm 91. And in Psalm 91, it talks about a trap. It says, he will free you from the fowler's snare. Now, a fowler is somebody that catches birds, that traps birds. You know, the next verse says, he will cover you with his feathers. The one who saves you from a bird trap becomes a bird. So that thought, I think Jesus walks into a trap that was made for us. He walked just like a, a, you can imagine a bird going into a bird trap to set other birds free. Jesus walks into a human trap by becoming human to set human beings free. He becomes fully human, but is the author of life. And, and, and when, when the devil says, yeah, I'll do that exchange, <laughs> Jesus has, has paid a ransom from those who held people captive. The good news is, death couldn't hold him. Actually, C.S. Lewis, in his major theological work, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, really explores this idea, really thoroughly, doesn't he? About um, this, this kind of someone who gives a victim willingly on behalf of someone else, and then there's a deeper magic at work than, than the enemy knows. And, and, and the enemy didn't realize that in trying to swallow up life with death, death gets swallowed up in life. And when Jesus descends into hell, it's like he takes the devil down to hell and leaves him there and rises up from it and leaves a great train of captives um, in, his, in his wake, as it were. So I want, I want to encourage you to see the ransom picture that cross is. Does that, have I made sense to you? Oh, you're, you're so kind. <laughs> um, but I just want to give you four outcomes that, that I think um, should change the way we do life. Well, the first thing is, God values us. I wonder how many people here struggle to feel that they're valued by God. And um, Jesus' death on the cross should be a message to you that you are valued, that you are precious, that Jesus considers you worth dying for, the Father considers you worth sending his son for. And actually, you're part of his bride. And the church, remember what I read from Acts 20, bought with his own blood. The church is precious to God, precious to Jesus. He went out to win a bride. He went out to buy her back from those powers that held her. He, he, he went out to clean her up and to bring her to a place where she could be beautiful for him. And in many ways, the story of the Bible is the story of that bride being ransomed, redeemed, and purified. And one day, Jesus is going to come back for that bride. And then the end will come. And the final victory that we're tasting now will be worked out forever. The very presence of sin destroyed. The very, you know, death will be no more. Literal, physical death will be no more. There'll be no more pain, no more sickness, no more death, no more tears. And that, as, as the bride comes down from heaven, beautifully arrayed for her husband, as Revelation 21 puts it, Revelation 22, it's a, that, that, that story of, of where history is going. So the thing is, you're loved by God. And believe it, because when you hear that voice saying you're not loved and you're not worthy and you're not clean, it's Satan standing at your right hand to accuse you, saying you're in filthy rags. And, and, and use that language from Zechariah. The Lord rebuke you, Satan. I'm a brand plucked from the burning. 
I've been rescued out of the fire. A brand put from the burning is a stick that's going to be burned up. But I was rescued from that place because God sent his son to rescue me. And now I belong to him forever. And nothing can snatch me out of his hands. That's good news. The second bit of good news is we don't need to fear death because just as it couldn't hold Jesus, it can't hold us. You see, the early church had to wrestle with the idea of people dying because they kind of thought, actually, Jesus is going to come back. No one's going to die anymore because they, they kind of got it that the death had been defeated. But the reality is that those who fall asleep in Christ, that's all it is. And death cannot hold us. We are going to rise again. And, and, and for people who don't know Jesus, death is the end of the world, isn't it? I mean, talk about global warming and the end of civilization. You know, when you die, the world ends if, if you don't have Jesus in your life, doesn't it? It's the end of the world. But for us, it's not the end of the world. It's the beginning of the world, actually. It's saying death cannot hold us. We are going to have resurrection bodies. We're going to have a life more glorious than we've yet known. And it's because Jesus has paid a ransom to death. Death has no right to keep us down. It can't hold us. That's good news. Not just for us, but for people we talk to. Third thing. A ransom has been paid for us. And if we accept it, then we can walk freely into the mercy and love of God. Now, it might be that, that you're here tonight and what I'm saying has gone a little bit over your head. Or it might be that you're saying, I'd like to know that freedom, but I'm not sure I'm there. And, and if someone has paid a ransom from you, for you, you've got to say yes to it. I mean, can you imagine if, you know, when Tina's been kidnapped by these people and I have sold my accordion and I've raised the money, and I've paid it there. She hasn't really realized she can just walk out now because the price has been paid. So we need to walk out and walk in. We're walking out of that place because the prison door is open. But we have to leave it, and that's the choice we make. And when we invite people to come to faith in Jesus, we're saying, Jesus has paid our ransom. He's given his life for you. You can be free, but you give your life to him. And that means you're walking out of that place and into a new place, which is the place you were always meant to be into, which is the kingdom of God and his family. And just a final thing that, that has relevance for us. We can renounce the devil and his areas of control over our lives. And I think we need to plead the cross where well, we feel in this present age there's areas of, of control. Because just like when the Israelites walked into the promised land, they, there was a, still a bit of skirmishing and fighting to do to, to really get hold of their inheritance. And sometimes even though we, we know that, that the, the cross has done it all, we've been paid for, we, we've still got little areas of collusion. It's like there's some, you know, it's like in, in the Middle East at the moment, ISIS has been overrun, hasn't it? But there are still... ISIS fighters out there, some little cells, some little groups, some the possibility of terror. And uh, we, we need to root those things out of our lives. And it's through the power of the cross and the blood of Jesus that we can say to those things that may exercise some areas of residual demonic control, anxiety, defeat in our lives. We can say, I plead over my life the blood of Jesus, the price of being paid for that. And um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm walking out of that. I'm not in a contractual obligation anymore to do or to be or to feel those things because the price has been paid. So get behind me, Satan. Now, it's powerful stuff. And the cross of Jesus Christ is powerful. And, and I want to just, as I finish, we're going to go back in a, in a time of, of, of worship and ministry. But it, it feels to me that it would be great if I could pray a prayer for people who feel that some aspect of what I've, I've said is relevant to them tonight. So in a moment too, I'm, I'm going to ask you to stand. And I'm going to ask you to stand if, if you feel that you've been held in an area of life where 
you've been in some sort of collusion with the enemy, or some sort of slavery, I'm going to pray that the power that's held you will be broken in the name of Jesus through the blood of Jesus who paid a ransom for you. It could be that today that you, you've been struggling with not feeling, not, not believing that you're truly precious and loved by God. And if that's you, I'd like to pray that you would, you would know through the revelation of the love of Jesus who died on the cross for you, that you are precious and that your life is worth something and that your head is going to be lifted up. I'd like to pray for you if you've been struggling with the fear of death, either because of your own, that you, you carry in your heart a, a deep anxiety about death, or that you're suffering because of bereavement and loss in your life and, and a sense of, of hopelessness and that, that's kind of settled over you. Perhaps you've seen death in a way that is, is tragic and traumatic. And I want to pray that the sting of death will be broken over your life. So if you're in any of those categories of people, I'd, I'd like you to, to stand now. Thank you. And as I pray, I just invite you to open your hands to receive what God has for you, to receive his free gift to you. Father of God, I pray for these men and women who are standing now in your presence. And I ask you, Holy Spirit, to minister to them in Jesus' name. And I want to pray, Lord God, that where there's been that voice, that accusing voice that says you are not clean and you're not loved and you can't have a place in God's kingdom, I speak to that lie in the name of Jesus and tell that voice to be quiet in the name of Jesus. And in the name of Jesus, I break that hold over your life. And I proclaim over you freedom in the knowledge that God, your Father, loves you. That Jesus, your Savior, loves you. That the Holy Spirit who is in you is the source of love and power. And release the love and joy of the Lord in that life right now. I pray in Jesus' name. And I want to pray too, Lord Jesus, where, where people have felt the... Uh, the, the captivity felt that it's as if they've joined a gang and they can't ever get free of that gang. And uh, where, where you have been in, in collusion with the evil one, where you felt that you are, are bound and you're not free, in the name of Jesus, I speak to those powers that come with control and accusation. And in the name of Jesus, I, I proclaim over these men and women freedom. To walk out of sin, out of captivity, out of anxiety and fear, out of, out of destructive habits and behaviors. And I walk into the freedom of the children of God and I proclaim over you mercy. I proclaim over you a prison that has its door wide open. I pro proclaim over you the, the, the holiness of God. And we say, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. Are not these men and women brands plucked from the burning to be clothed in clean clothes? I pray that over you in the name of Jesus. Yeah. Thank you. Well, yeah. That will do. Father God, thank you so much that you're here with your mercy. Amen.